everyone. Happy New Year. We're so excited to be back with you, uh, bringing you the Flint Community Webinar, your community resource every Friday at noon, our partnership between Michigan State University, the HFRCC. And this week we have great people from the Crim Fitness Foundation to talk to you today. I'm sure some of us had, or at least I did, had some of those New Year's resolutions to rededicate ourselves to healthy living and fitness and nutrition. And so we've asked the great people at Crim to come talk to us a little bit more today about the resources that they have to offer. So we've got Lauren Halalei Zembo here, CEO of Crim Fitness Foundation. We've got our own Steve Mundersma and uh, Janae McCoy White to talk to you a little bit. And so we're going to get started. Thank you so much to everyone for coming to talk to us about keeping our communities healthy. I'm going to hand it off to Lauren. Thank you so much for being here today to talk about the resources that CRIM brings to the community. No problem. I'm so excited uh, to be here anytime I get to talk about everything that the CRIM does. It's very exciting. So one of the things I want to do, though, first is kind of start uh, my presentation, how we start meetings at the CRIM, which is with a mindful moment. So, um, you know, we've just come back from probably holiday breaks. We've been rushing around. We're trying to figure out where we're at, what we have to do in the new year. And so we're just going to take a moment to center ourselves uh, in this moment it, uh, at noon on a Friday to hear about the great resources in Flint. So if you would try it out for me, uh, a mindful moment can be really easy. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes or just soften your gaze downward. And just take a deep breath and feel what it feels like to just be breathing. Our body does it automatically for us. And so sometimes we don't notice that we're breathing. So just kind of notice what it feels like to breathe. And then try and drop everything else that's on your to-do list or you have going on and just focus on being here with these people in this virtual room today to talk about the great things that are happening in Flint. And then just take one more deep breath, maybe the deepest breath you've taken today and let it out and come back to the room. So hopefully everybody feels centered and they're here. Um, I am really excited to talk to you today about uh, the Crim Fitness Foundation. Let me share my screen real quick. Can everybody see my screen? Can somebody tell me? It looks great. Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about the CRIM at 45, the CRIM's journey to creating a community of well-being. And so we just uh, celebrated our 45th anniversary in 2022. We have been a part of this community. And what I hope to leave you with today is that every participant leaves with something new uh, that they didn't know about the CRIM because a lot of times uh, people know us for one thing or another. And I hope today you learn something new about what we have to offer and how you might be able to engage with us. So I was gonna do a test, but since I can't see the participants, I'm just interested in how many people have ever heard of the CRIM 
or have participated in a race. So maybe just drop that in the Q&A for me and I'll take a look at it later. But just let us know, show us some love if you've uh, participated in any of our programs. So um, our journey really started in 1977 um, and we've been known for the Crim Festival of Races uh, started by Bobby Crim. And after 45 years, of course, here we are. Uh, even in 2020, when we had the first ever year where we could not hold a race, uh, we had a virtual race with nearly 4,000 participants, which we believe is just a testament to the community's love for the crim. Um, following that, we welcomed more than 7,000 racers back in 2021, and we had more than uh, 8,500 in 2022. So we're seeing a strong comeback in, in the race. What I hope you see today is that the CRIM is really involved in every facet of the community. So we really like to think of ourselves uh, in this graphic where we are involved in everything from schools, parks, sports, gardens, uh, transportation systems, uh, all of it looking at how can we make environments, programs, places where people can be healthy. So we have a few different programs. We have, of course, the Crim Festival of Races, the adult training program. We have our Flint Community Education Initiative, our Mindful Flint Initiative, sports nutrition, and active communities. And I'm gonna go into a little bit about uh, each of those programs during this presentation. So love this, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the top is Bobby Krim and Lois Craig and they created the race back in 1977 sitting around Lois's kitchen table, all volunteers, nobody paid and turned it into something that now is uh, 47 individuals. This is just a snapshot in time, we're constantly changing but this uh, beautiful staff that I have the privilege of working with every day uh, out in the community delivering programs. So it's kind of amazing to see the growth and the accomplishment of something that one guy had a, a dream of creating a race to turning into something that really helps with health and wellness throughout the entire year in every facet of our community. So our vision at the CRIM is to cultivate accessible, vibrant communities in Flint and Genesee County that encourage people to lead healthy lifestyles by integrating physical activity, healthy eating, and mindfulness into their daily lives. And we mentor other communities to do the same. We believe that if we can do it here in Flint and we figured something out, we should be able to help other communities, you know, not recreate that wheel, but really if we've learned something, we can share it with them. So I'll now talk a little bit about uh, each of our program areas. So first is, of course, I mentioned our race and training program always happens the fourth Saturday in August. If you haven't been, I highly encourage you to either participate or just come out and watch because it truly is a celebration of Flint and everything that it offers and it runs through the streets and the people are amazing that come out uh, and support our race. We generally have um, on average 10,000 runners and walkers. That was kind of pre-pandemic, those are our numbers. And we have one of the largest training programs in the nation, usually over a thousand people participating. Uh, this is a program that meets every Tuesday night and groups get together, it's very social and they train for the crim. Uh, and then at, at the end of the season, they, you know, celebrate by doing the race. So if you have ever thought maybe that you couldn't run or walk the crim, I promise you can because I did it myself. I had never uh, run or walked uh, the 10 mile prior to coming to the crim 14 years ago, but now I am a regular runner. So, and it was only due to the training program. So I highly encourage you to check that out if it's something you're interested in. Um, let me go. We also have 18 community sites that we work with, churches, schools that meet directly at their sites and participate together. So for instance, a church may have a training group uh, where they meet at their church every Wednesday and they have participated in the CRIM training program to get ready for uh, the race as well. So uh, in 2022, we had over 1,100 participants, 18 community sites, and uh, 400 participants in our community training program throughout Flint participating. We also know that uh, along with physical activity, nutrition is an important part of a healthy lifestyle. So we have 
uh, been conducting nutrition education in more than 30 sites, uh, you know, more than 800 lessons per year, 9,000 residents. And we do this primarily in schools, grocery stores, food pantries, the farmer's market, um, pretty much anywhere there's uh, people we will, we will be to help uh, educate around food and food systems. Uh, we have gardens at most of the uh, Flint community schools. So we do a lot of work around not only educating people about uh, healthy nutrition, but where does it come from? How do you grow it? Working with kids to understand how to grow their food, taste new foods that they haven't before, working in the garden. So this is really uh, an exciting uh, opportunity that we've had over many years to really expand our nutrition education also into gardening. Along with that, in 2020, uh, we started exploring a food pantry policy council. And so now we have established the Flint and Genesee Food Policy Council, which I think probably many of our partners, I've seen some are on this call, but really looking at what are some of the food policies and systems that we can change to make sure that uh, residents in the greater Flint area have access to healthy food. So it's not enough to just educate people if they don't have access as well. Um, it's not gonna create the change, the lasting change that we want to. We also work to activate neighborhoods. So we want, uh, if we tell people to come and run the crim, we know that they need to have a safe place to train. And so we wanted to make sure that we're also activating our neighborhoods. We uh, focus on changing policies and the actual environment to make it safe and conducive to people to do that. And we do that through a number of different ways. We've had the Safe and Active Genesee for Everyone Coalition for more than 10 years, which is a multidisciplinary coalition that works on these policy environmental changes. We do safe routes to school programs to help schools uh, make it easier for kids to walk and bike to school, bike education. Uh, we have a traffic taming task force, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we've done work around the census and we provide technical assistance to really anyone, neighborhood uh, groups, uh, municipalities who are trying to look at how they can better design their environments uh, for a healthy living. So some of our um, accomplishments that, you know, maybe, maybe people don't know about, but we've been doing this work for a long time. And if you've ever seen these signs, this picture of these signs uh, out on the trail, this is specifically on U of M Flint. Uh, Sage Coalition was responsible for doing over 300 wayfinding signs. Uh, in the city of Flint on trails and really led the way in making sure that we have consistent wayfinding trail signage uh, throughout the county. So we've done that. We've worked, as I mentioned, with municipalities and our members, because of their experience in all this, have participated in everything from local parks and recreation plans, uh, non-motorized plans, to uh, the city of Flint master plan. So some of the other ways that we uh, make sure that we are building health into Flint's neighborhoods is that we offer a Neighbors Changing Flint Leadership Series. Uh, it's usually a six-week series that we offer to help people learn about planning, zoning, advocacy, to really make sure that they can make the changes that they want to see in their neighborhoods and really build up that capacity for leadership. Uh, we've been working, uh, of course, with the City of Flint on educate, education and advocacy for zoning. Um, so making sure that that new zoning code that was just uh, actually passed by the city of Flint takes into account health, uh, it takes into account healthy living, how can people get around the city easily, how can we make it sure that the environment is conducive again. So I talked a little bit about the traffic teaming task force. One of the things that came up was residents were coming to us and telling us that there was a lot of people speeding through their neighborhoods and it was very dangerous. So we actually purchased two radar signs um, to monitor driving patterns. And what we've seen is that there's a 30% reduction in the rates of speeding after we install these signs. Um, and that has further led to help do 60 temporary speed bumps uh, to help further calm the traffic in neighborhoods. So we talked a little bit about physical activity, talked about nutrition, talked about the environment, and then what we learned in our journey to health is that mindfulness was another important component. So we couldn't just... Um, if we had experienced trauma or um, weren't in the right frame of mind to be able to start exercising, eat healthy, we needed mindfulness. 
So more than 10 years ago, uh, we brought mindfulness into a core component of what the CRIM does. And so a lot of times people ask us like, what is that? Is that meditation? Is it yoga? It's really just the basic human ability to be present and aware. And so we practice that a little bit uh, in the beginning of this webinar. And so it's really just helping us kind of make those decisions and kind of pausing and being in the present moment. So we started this work uh, 10 years ago and we started in schools, uh, working with teachers and students, um, doing lessons. And what we found was that it was amazing. The students were really responding to it. Uh, they were going home. They were talking to their parents about it. They were practicing when they would maybe have a traumatic event at home and they said, I would go in my bedroom and I would just practice my mindfulness. And that really helped me. And so what we knew we needed to do is we need to really expand and take this to all the schools. And as you can see uh, from this chart in 2013, we were working really with just over a thousand Flint youth. And as you look to 2021, uh, we're over 5,000 Flint youth and we're also now serving educators and parents um, and caregivers because what was happening, as I mentioned, they were going home and they were saying, uh, hey, we're doing this mindfulness stuff at school. And the parents were saying, well, what is that? I don't know what that is. And in order to reinforce it, we knew that we had to take it to the parents as well. Um, and they've responded. And now it's become sort of systematic in the way that um, they function in their classrooms. A lot of the classrooms have mindfulness corners where students can opt to take a break or they'll regularly practice in their class or they'll take a break between a change in subjects from reading to math. Some of our schools do one whole mindful moment in the morning all together as a building. So it's really dependent on the culture of the school, but it has been uh, really kind of life-changing uh, for the way that they um, serve, uh, the way that they are in their schools. Oops. So I just wanted to show you a few um, pictures, everything from, you know, we work with, um, preschools. So there's a, a, an example from Cummings of preschool parents practicing together, um, PE, yoga, students um, doing mindfulness. So based on the success of uh, the education sector, uh, we really wanted to take the concept of mindfulness and awareness and compassionate leadership into the entire city. And so uh, we've been working with the um, Foundation for a Mindful Society, uh, and we've actually been named the flagship city for mindfulness uh, and taking it into a five sector model. So we know that mindfulness may look different uh, in the business sector than it may look in a school, but we want to make sure that we're bringing these concepts of awareness and mental health into all of the sectors. So we work in these um, five sectors um, we have worked with MSU. I know we've done pilots with uh, doctors and making sure that they're practicing mindfulness. So we do everything from pilot projects to figure out what works best in each sector. We have community classes. We have different online uh, trainings uh, to offer to each of these sectors. So we started, um, we've also, um, done a train the trainer ambassador model. Um, so we reach more than 10,000 people with only a staff of five people. And we also have trained um, first responders uh, in mindfulness as well. I know we've trained over 44 first responders and we work with Brown University, Michigan State University to research the impacts of this so that we can share it widely. So one of our programs is um, Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. Some of you on this call maybe have participated, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. But it is a program that came out of Google that teaches um, awareness, emotional intelligence, leadership. It's 16 hours, uh, and it's, it's a really great training. And when we brought it to the Flint community, we had such interest that we knew we wanted to bring it to as many people as possible. And we created a fellowship with the help of the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. So these people you see on the screen, many of which maybe you know, um, we have 18 trained facilitators and this is intense. So these uh, members of the community and our staff have gone through a year long 
fellowship training. Uh, they have to do a practicum and then they have to be certified uh, as a teacher of this program. And they all have done that. And so we're able to deliver this program uh, throughout the community. And if you see the um, colors around their, their pictures, those are, um, they're related to a sector. So they typically teach uh, in that sector, but they don't have to. So we've tried to get a really diverse group of people with um, backgrounds so that they can talk to their peers and colleagues about the concept of mindfulness. So we also, uh, are the lead agency for the Flint Community Education Initiative. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a program that was um, started by C.S. Mott and Frank Manley back in 1935 and really cutting edge at the time of making schools open after school time for various activities, anything from recreation uh, activities, parents' classes, kids coming back open to do sports, but the idea was that why should the building close at three o'clock when we have this space and we have the ability to do other things. So back in 2012 when the city of Flint master plan was redone, uh, the community really said, I think we should bring this community education model back. And so the CRIM was asked to help lead that effort. And so since 2014, we have been implementing. We started in two schools in 2014 and we are now in 13 school sites, all uh, Flint Community Schools, International Academy of Flint, and Flint Cultural Center Academy. We work, if you see our model on this side, we really work on four goals, increasing student attendance, graduation rates, uh, increasing third grade reading levels, and then really being uh, what I like to call an asset to the neighborhood in sort of a reciprocal way where we can help the community, um, but the community can also help us bring resources to the school. So through this program, community members, students, parents have access to a lot of different supports. Each school is a little bit different in what they have, but they all have a, just a robust group of supports for families outside the classroom. We really like to make sure that teachers are able to teach and provide education, and we come around the families and hopefully provide anything else they need for their students and their families to be successful. So just some of the examples is we do, um, we do success mentoring, we help mentor kids, help improve attendance. We have college and career readiness. We have access to fitness programs, nutrition education, parenting, financial literacy, GED. Um, we have community health workers. I saw Jim on here somewhere from Jenny's health plan, but community health workers in every school that help support navigating any kind of health resource that a family would need um, through these community health workers. They help us with attendance, making sure that the kids have what they need to be in school. We organize after school programs, community-wide sports, and really address any basic needs gaps. So if we hear that there's a food issue, we try and figure that out. We've had families come to us that have maybe been homeless, we try to help support them in finding uh, sustainable housing. So anything that you can think of that community school uh, director that is at the school is a resource for anything and everything that a family may need. And what we found was that in 2021, we released our um, evaluation results. And what we found is that it's working so that kids that participate in our activities or interact with us in any way, it has a positive impact on their academic achievement. Um, we also know that if they um, are participating, we're seeing that they're more likely to have better attendance as well. So the other thing that uh, we also bring to the schools is our CRIM sports program. So we bring sports uh, to kids kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, the schools didn't have sports programs. And so we brought this back and we offer 20 plus sports a year, uh, about a thousand individual students or more impacted each year. But think about your typical kids are going out and maybe they're playing travel sports or something. These families did not have the access to any kind of sport program. So we provide this all free of charge where families can sign up for a sport, 
they can participate. All the schools play against each other in an intramural style. And it has been wonderful to watch the growth of this program. It does a few things besides provide great opportunities for students to participate in sports. We've seen that it helps increase attendance, right? So if you don't show up to school, you're probably not gonna be able to come to sports practice. So kids are coming to school, they're learning. We're seeing parents show up and engage with the school who haven't before because they're coming to their kids' games. And now they're talking to the teachers or they're talking to the principal. So we provide this for no cost uh, to families. CRIM is also home to the Greater Flint Olympian Games uh, and Canusa Games, which started in 1957, the longest running international games. And so we support making sure that those kids that participate in our fundamental sports program, hopefully in the summer are moving into the Greater Flint Olympian Games and then even into the Canusa Games to participate in um, competing against their you know, Canadian friends in Hamilton, Ontario. So that's a, that's a lot of what we do. Um, I want to bring us back to this picture so that hopefully that you can see uh, the CRIM is more than a race. Uh, the CRIM is in every facet of the community. And so when you leave here today, I hope you remember this picture of us uh, in all of these different places. Um, let me see if this works. So the other, the last thing that I want to do, though, so we always start our meetings with mindfulness. We try to always leave our meetings with a launch, which is something that is inspiring um, so that we all leave in a good place. And so I'm going to try and share this video uh, and see if that works. Tell me if you. Hi, I'm a mom out here with my son who absolutely uh -huh. loves soccer. And the Flint City Bucks team is mentoring them, taking them through drills and different skills. And it's an excellent opportunity for those team players to mentor the younger students. And I'm so excited that my son has this opportunity. All right, hi, I'm a mom out here with my two kids. Uh, they're uh, enjoying some soccer with the Flint City Bots. And what we enjoy doing is we've been coming to almost all of the CRIM sponsored programs in these sports. And it's great because the kids get to try new things that we don't have to have all the equipment for and all of the equipment for. We've just come on out. You know, we're going to go fishing in a few weeks. We've gone roller skating. We've gone bowling. So it's a great opportunity for my kids to try new things with a, a low entry point to it. So we really enjoy doing it, plan on doing almost all the rest all summer long. All right, so my daughter is really loving this. She was really excited to come after school today. And I was excited that there's a program like this for her because I know nothing about soccer. So, um, but she's loving it. She's doing all the different rotations and it'll help her improve. And we were excited and she's really excited that the Flint City Bucks are helping out. and. I'm working full for the CRIM organization to do this. Yes, yeah, so I brought my eight-year-old daughter out here today and uh, to get her a little bit of introduction to soccer and uh, to uh, meet some professional players and get trained by them so she can, you know, get a little bit of better understanding of the game. I know uh, um, it's good for the community. You know, uh, it's a great program that they got going on out here. You do it every year. Uh, we got some fantastic uh, coaches and players from you know the semi protein and uh, i think it's a great day yeah when my when my kids hit the field their eyes lit up um we went to our first bucks game last year kind of by accident and it's just really really you know just just swept over our family they um they love the environment they love being there love they love the interaction with the players like it's um you know we've, we've occasionally been to sports events in place else in the bigger place and you can't ever come close. And, you know, even last summer, chance to meet the players, you know, touch and see and, you know, be a part of the, the sport is like really turn my kids into soccer fans. And I think they they wouldn't have said that at the beginning, but they're, they're here. Yeah, they, they came out and saw the balls. They ran out and they've been talking to players playing. It's just um, it's cool to see as a parent. It's, um, I think it's one of our favorite things about Flint and just the ability to connect with people. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like a big city thing. Uh, with a small town feel and that's just um that is a good example of that you've got uh, professional level athletes that are playing with kids and there's a lot of access and you know sharing is just a really neat environment um to see neighbors here and talk to friends is uh really special perfect weather too so yeah we want to say thanks bucks um and i know my kids would say it too so appreciate it
So thank you for your um, attention today. It's hard to talk and not have people respond, but um, I can take any questions if that's, um, if anybody has any or drop them in the uh, Q and A and I'll try and answer. Lauren, you have one question in the chat at least, and it says, how can, uh, how can you enroll in the train, the trainer and the leadership fellowship? Um, I will put you in contact with our mindfulness department. That's fantastic. I see that that's from, uh, that looks like Dr. Gordon in the chat. And you've got a couple people who really sort of engaged with the, the crim before. Um, and I saw a couple faces that I recognized that were great. I saw Dr. Wolf on there and we got a couple community members. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm trying to see if there's any other. There's another question that says, how can someone join the Food Policy Council? I will put you in touch with, uh, that would be Sam Farah, who's our food systems director. So can you talk to us? Go ahead. I'm going to put these um, contacts um, in the uh, chat. Absolutely. And can you talk to us a little bit more about, so what would that process look like? So you've got someone who wants to join, they talk to Sam, what happens next? Um, I really just think it would be talk to them and figure out what, if it makes sense for them to join about what, you know, why they're interested and time commitment and all that kind of stuff to see if that makes sense. Absolutely. That makes total sense. And as we, I think I see, we've got uh, Dr. Gordon and Nurse T and uh, Nurse T has a question. I see her hand raised. Thanks for putting that information in the chat, Lauren. Yep. Go ahead, Nurse T. Oh, okay. Um, great, great presentation, great information. Um, and I, you know, I am a huge fan of the CRIM and I am becoming more familiar with uh, mindfulness. Um, my, um, I have a question. Um, and it's a true um, question. And I don't want to offend anyone but I, I just want to share the transparency from the heart of a nurse and caring um, for patients. Um, I think that um, mindfulness would be beneficial um, to frontline nurses because we have experienced a lot of trauma and with um, the healthcare shortages now and the higher acuity of patients that we have coming in, a lot of times, you know, I was just thinking about when, when you guys, um, when you showed the video of the mindfulness and I was just thinking as a nurse on the floor or even in management, that's five seconds. I couldn't even shut down my mind to, to rest because what I would be worried about is how am I gonna meet the needs of the patients? How am I you know, going to be able to successfully take care of the patients? And then if something you know, go wrong or we don't meet their expectations and then we are having a lot of emotional challenges. So I was just wondering, is there an opportunity or do you, do you, do you think that it would be wise to try to create a mindfulness for nurses and healthcare workers? Because I think that they could really benefit from something like this and it would equip them to be able to stay stronger on front line so that they could be able to provide the care um, that they have went to school for and is so passionate about. Absolutely. Like what we can do, contact me, contact Sarah, that is part of our health sector. So when I mentioned our five sector approach, health is a huge part of that. And we've done some work, but honestly, we need to get in there more. And I completely agree with you on nurses. I think there's two aspects of that. I would call it dedicated practice, maybe for the nurses themselves, right? Because on the front line, you've experienced, as you mentioned, that trauma and the shortage of staff. And so really taking care of you uh, first as a human being, but then also how do you do integrated practice um, throughout the day? 
to help you be more prepared before you go into. So we can imagine what it would be like if our doctors and our nurses maybe just took three breaths before they walked into the exam room or before they, you know, before surgery. I think as a patient, all of us would want that, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, we don't want somebody that's running around and all stressed, like, you know, uh, operating or, or on us. So I think definitely that we would love to work with nurses. Um, so if that's an opportunity, please let's, let's explore that. Okay. Thank I you. think that conversation is really timely, especially as we think about the, the sort of events we saw happen in sports with Damar Hamlin. And we talk about how people experience emergencies, right? And nurse T, your experience in ICU spaces. And we think about how rushing to perform CPR on someone and then going to the next patient might be something that you experience without space in between, right? So when you talk about even those three breaths to recenter yourself and think about what's the next step? What do I need to do? How can I center myself? It seems like such a really timely and important conversation for all of our frontline workers, like you alluded to, Nurse T. Because we don't want them to quit because what I see now is a lot of compassion fatigue, a, a lot of um, burnout, um, and especially now with the acuity of our patients, you know, I go to um, our ER quite frequently and I, you know, educate and talk and empower the staff and I know that they're doing a, a good job, but I just really believe that nurses abroad could really benefit from something like this, just to keep them empowered to be able to provide that patient care because it's nothing like going home at the end of the day and realizing that you didn't get to meet the needs of the patients and that some of the patients left and you didn't get to care for them. And it was because you gave all that you had, but you can't work from an empty cup. Right. I think that's such a timely and important point. Dr. Gordon? Oh yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Another uh, take on that is starting uh, when the nurses or healthcare people enter during school, teaching them that process before that, you know, we can get the ones that, you know, I've been in healthcare for 32 years. And as Nurse T said, you know, the changes that have uh, been occurring with the pandemic, you got pandemic fatigue, mass fatigue, uh, just everything that's you know going on and having that you know being short or um, the lack of resources that you need to properly care for patients that's going on throughout the whole nation but if we could start in nursing school um, teaching those um, principles maybe that will help like when you go there because like you say in the heat of it when you have a cold or you have an, uh, a new admit come through or you're taking care of patients out of your normal um, uh, care practice, um, knowing that, you know, before, okay, let me stop. Like you say, you're in that mode where almost like you put yourself as a martyr. I don't have time to think about myself. I have to think about my patients, you know, I have to think about the families. So just teaching those things that would be excellent. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Lauren, when you talk about the health sector, we've talked a little bit about, about nurses and frontline professionals. Are there other health professions that you all have been attached to and you've provided resources for that are in the community? Um, I know we have worked with the MSU pediatric residents, um, so we've done some of that. We've worked with Whaley Children's Center, so sort of in the, and uh, Mott Children's um, Hospital, so people who are working with youth, uh, making sure that they're both, as I said, both personal practice, right? So I'm taking care of myself and making sure that I'm okay, but then also using it in practice with other individuals. Um, trying to think if there's any, those are the two that are sticking out uh, in my mind um, right now. That's fantastic. I want to ask you one more favor. I wondered if you'd lead us through another mindful moment before we pivot to the wonderful Steve Undersma and Janae McCoy-White. Sure, sure. That's so exciting. I'm like, people, I'm like, people are going to be, uh, I don't know how people are going to respond. So that's cool. Let's do another one. So just, um, You've heard a lot of information. So either close your eyes or soften your gaze and just take a deep breath. You heard a lot of information. I talked for a long time. So just deep breath and audible exhale. And then just kind of feeling your breath as your anchor, letting your body settle again.
and preparing for Steve next, just to kind of give him all of your attention. And then maybe let's feel what it feels like to practice gratitude. So maybe um, send Steve, think of Steve right now and send him all your well wishes for as he, you know, presents. See what that feels like when you send someone well wishes in your body. Where do you feel it? Feel it in your head, maybe in your chest. I'm going to just take one more collective breath. Come back to the space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. You have so many wonderful resources for the community. I see Nurse T all smiles and excited. So I know that mindful moment was really valuable to, to, to me. And I, I see her nodding as well. So thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, as we said, we're gonna pivot a little bit. I'm super excited because the next two are colleagues. We've had Dr. McCoy White with us before. We've also uh, talked a lot about Dr. Steven Anderzma. Both are big colleagues of mine. Lots of love for these two. They're gonna talk a little bit about apathons for community engaged app development. And if you remember, um, the the when we were here last dr mccoy white talked a lot about her work with maternal mortality and a lot of her efforts to sort of hear her right as the as am i saying it right dr mccoy white um making sure that we're listening uh to to mothers and she talked about how they're developing some apps to be thoughtful about how they engage with the community about issues just like this. So I'd like to turn over uh, the mic to Dr. Andersma and Dr. McCoy White to talk a little bit about their work in this area. Thank you so much, Dr. EJ and Lauren, thank you first for really a truly fantastic presentation. And I'm touched by all the collective well wishes from the group. And uh, believe me, I was returning that gratitude right back to you and uh, everybody throughout. So I, I do really appreciate it. Um, Dr. McCoy White and I are delighted to be talking with you today. We're excited about technology. We're excited about a particular type of technology that we've developed in our lab. And we're especially excited about the ways in which this new technology can let us work in collaboration with the community to address issues that are of importance to Flint and to our area. Talk just a little bit about what we're doing, explain some of our activities. We'll turn it over to Dr. McCoy White for a bit, and then we'll look forward to taking questions. But please, anything that isn't clear, if you wanna raise your hand or just shout out, please don't hesitate if there's anything that, uh, anything that comes up in the middle. So, of course, we could talk uh, for a very, very long time, unfortunately, about all the areas of inequity and health disparities. I'm particularly interested in pregnancy and the postpartum period. It's one of the areas in which disparities are most stark and most uh, impactful, in my opinion. Um, and what you're looking at here with infant mortality rates by race and ethnicity is certainly one of them. You see the same with birth weight, size for gestational age, for maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, it's a significant issue and there are many, many more. Why we haven't solved them is of course another really big question that we could talk about for a long time, but I wanna draw your attention to what I believe is one particularly important and underappreciated reason why we haven't solved some of these problems. And it's this, that the vast majority of people in some areas or a simple majority of people in other areas who could benefit from services and who need services don't get them, okay? That's 90% when we're talking about substance use disorders. It's 57% when we're talking about any form of mental illness. This is a huge challenge. When we look at these bars here at the bottom of people who are getting treatment, that to me and that to us is a success. And that is not our focus. 
our focus is on these huge groups of people who are not getting any sort of help for a whole host of reasons. We think that technology can be an extremely important and effective way to help bring treatment to more people, whether through brief technology delivered interventions or through using technology to help promote connections to those more intensive person delivered sorts of services. Here's some of the advantages that we believe technology has. One is that it's widely available and accessible. So of course there are those who don't have access, who aren't comfortable using technology, but that is a small number. It is getting smaller and by far the biggest factor in determining whether or not you have and use technology is not income. It is not race, ethnicity, demographics, it's age. If you're a younger person, the odds that you have a smartphone and that you're very good with using it are extremely high. So our focus in terms of uh, pregnancy, we can count on very high rates of smartphone ownership and high, very high rates of being comfortable with technology. Those rates, uh, uh, the rates of those who don't have access are getting smaller all the time. And there are things that can be done to also further close that gap. So that's one big advantage, I think, um, of technology. Another is, is that can be provided anonymously. So stigma is one of those big reasons why people aren't getting services and aren't getting connected to care. They're not raising their hand saying, I need help in this area because they're ashamed or they're worried about the repercussions if they do raise their hand. Technology can, provide it, can be provided privately, can be provided anonymously, and that gives it a significant advantage with those groups. It's far easier to provide to wide groups of people on a very broad scale at low cost once you develop technology to maintain it and disseminate it is a very low cost endeavor and that gives it a lot of power. We also know that people are more likely to disclose stigmatized things to technology than to a person. So that gives technology this important tool, this important ability for recognizing and identifying this. It's unaffected by distance. So rural areas or people who don't have good access to transportation, these challenges can be partially addressed using technology. You can keep reaching them for a very long period of time using proactive text messages and other sorts of approaches. Technology can be personalized for each user. So you never have to give a one size fits all. Here's the intervention that we provide and it's the same for everybody. It can be personalized based on their context, their needs, their background, their preferences. The strategy is that science has shown work better with people who have those particular characteristics for that particular background. You can do so much, not to mention language. It's very easy with the technology that we use to translate it into multiple languages so that people can access it in a, in a language that's most comfortable for them. And then finally, and this is really important, I wanna highlight this, as opposed to a typical large scale program, person delivered treatment, we can make technology completely and fully transparent in getting feedback from the community. So instead of simply describing what a therapeutic encounter might look like or the broad strokes of what a program, of how a program might work, you can show the exact version of the technology to anybody with lived experience from the affected community and get really detailed, excellent feedback on that. But in fact, so although we think that's a big strength, we think we can go one better. And it has to do with this, with these big trends in software and in technology. Um, what you're looking at is, is obviously a hand sketch. It's by the, by the tech writer, Michael Dubikoff. He talks about broad trends in technology going back to the 1960s and 70s when technology was really restricted to those people who had technical expertise. These were the really early adopters, the people who knew how to code in basic, and could do things using the technology. As we got into the 80s and beyond, it was the era of personal software. You could go to a store, 
You could buy a box containing a floppy disk. You could put that disk into your own personal computer, and then you could do really neat things with it, like use spreadsheets or use word processing software. More recently, we're in the age of the, of the internet where you could actually collaborate with others together on the same content, the same document, the same spreadsheet, the same website. Okay? And you could work together interactively with people. And that was a huge, huge leap in the way that we can use technology. But now we're in a new revolution and it's called the no code software revolution. And it's one in which anybody without any programming skills, without any technical ability whatsoever, can design their own software, can design their own apps. And that opens up a whole new universe of power and creativity and collaboration that we think is really exciting, but until recently, it wasn't available to people interested in doing things around health and health and equity. But we, with funding from the National Institutes of Health, have been able to develop a tool that we call the Computerized Intervention Authoring System, or SIAS as we call it, that puts that power in the hands of anybody. Any one of us, any one of you using this software can easily create extremely sophisticated, interactive and engaging apps for anything that you want. You can do it quickly and you can do it at zero cost. That does a lot of things, especially given all the power. So we have multiple languages, it translates into other languages. It can do text messaging, it can do videos and images. It can give summaries, it can send reports either to a provider or to the person, him or herself or to anybody else, many powerful things. But because it's easy to use, we can actually, instead of having researchers like myself and Dr. McCoy White working on technology and coming to the community and saying, how is this? How can we make this better? And then going back and trying to make it better. We can actually create it from the ground up together. And we're especially excited about doing that in events that we call apathons. You may have heard of hackathons. These are events where Coders come together, they work really hard on a particular problem over the course of two or three days, and whoever's solution is best wins a big prize. That's a hackathon. We call it Appathon because in our early meetings with community partners, they thought hackathon sounded a little bit dodgy. It didn't sound quite like it was on the up and up. So Appathon it is, and we love that name. In its essence, an Appathon is an event where people come together to work on a solution, often with friendly competition involved, with the winner decided by a panel of judges at the end of the event. Our apathons, which we call the Flint MSU Community Apathons, which we've been doing in partnership with the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, who has been invaluable and Nina Lewis, our, our primary partner on that has, has just been incredible for us. Um, they're three day hybrid events in which we have initial meetings where we form teams, we discuss the topic at hand, we talk about the ways in which we can use the software and the sorts of videos that we can create to put into the software. And then we start working together in teams and then have the competition and have the panel of judges decide on the winner. Um, it's an exciting, fun event. That's the idea. We have lots of neat things built into it, like cool Apathon swag um, that, that, that makes it really fun. We had our first one about six months ago or so, um, and the focus was on COVID-19 vaccination during pregnancy. So we had two teams working together. It worked over a period of days. Then we got for the last day, we got together at the Flint Journal building um, and had a great time and worked really hard. And at the end, we were really delighted to find that the participants felt like it was a positive experience. They felt like it was empowering them to do new things to help their community and they wanted to do it again. So we're in the process of planning a second one 
with the topic this time being chosen through a community survey, um, letting the community tell us where they thought the biggest need was. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. McCoy White, who can talk a little bit about that process and about the next upcoming episode. Yes, so um, we did survey about 65 community members and the topic that they chose came from the, um, the community health needs assessment. We talked to them about the top five. Out of those top five community health needs assessment, 77%, um, about uh, 55 people said they would like to have uh, Apathon on mental health and how to frame mental health. Um, so we are now in the process of getting that together, our Apathon. We will be working with Michigan State University's medical students, um, those who are in the uh, public health certificate program. We'll be working alongside community uh, partners uh, to work on content built around, built into science. Uh, for mental health. And that's talking about what is mental health, how, um, how can they understand what their providers are saying, how they can talk to their providers, and how to find resources in uh, the Flint and Genesee County area for uh, their mental health needs. Um, we have informational sessions set up January 10th, 17th, and 24th. Um, those are virtual. Uh, February 13th, we will start our assigning our teams and they will meet with the um, medical students. And then February 17th and 18th are the actual day of the Apathon. So the 17th will be a virtual day, but they will meet uh, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, virtually. And we will uh, discuss and start breaking out into their teams to just discuss their ways and their their um, their strategy for their apathon, their uh, content for their apathon. And then February 18th, we will have a full day from 9 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. in the Flint Journal building. Uh, from that day, we will provide breakfast and lunch. HFRCC will be providing the continental breakfast and uh, Dr. Andersma's team will be providing lunch for that day and snack where they will do their actual um, working on their content and their intervention on mental health. It's really good and I'm excited for everyone to join uh, in on that and I hope that it is as exciting as those who are signing up. We do have individuals who are signing up, number one, for our informational sessions. And then those who say, you know what, I just want to be a part of the Apathon. So they're going to go through the informational sessions as well as the Apathon. And we intend for this to be an ongoing process. We want to be doing Apathons continuously on new topics that are of importance to the community. If you're interested in participating, or if you're just interested in using the software for your own work, your own, uh, your own efforts, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're delighted to provide training and make it available to you so that you can do things that you, uh, that you think you could be doing with, with technology. Um, I think that is, it. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, certainly I think we have time for a couple questions and we'd uh, be delighted to answer any questions that anybody has. No, this was phenomenal. It's so exciting to see the opportunity for community to get involved in solutions and creating the solutions to problems that we see, right? And just really being at the table and involved. Quick question, how do we sign up? Janae, you want to take that? Yes, so they would uh, email me um, at uh, McCoyJON at MSU.edu. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and that's how they will sign up. And I, and I will contact them from there. Fantastic. I hope you're ready for your email to blow up. <laughs> it has been a wonderful pleasure. Thank you so much for talking all about this wonderful um, opportunity for people to get involved with developing an app or apps that could be really useful for um, community problem solving. I think this is really fantastic. 
thanks again for joining us. I'm going to say a special thank you to Lauren again for reminding us to keep mindfulness at the front of what we do and for reminding us all about the CRIM resources. It was so wonderful to have you. A reminder, as always, to our community health workers about how to access their CEU units and what they need to do. Thank you so much again for your time and enjoyment today. Let's stay connected. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Wonderful seeing everyone today. Thank you again. That was really, that was really good. Um, one thing that I was thinking about